Hey everybody, uh, today I'm going to talk about Anita Sarkeesian, a feminist game critic who became incredibly famous on the internet around 2012. So Anita Sarkeesian is, without a doubt, one of the most divisive figures I can think of, at least within a very specific cultural context. To the skeptics and anti-SJWs, she's seen in all ways as a force for bad. A dishonest critic, an opportunist, a scam artist, an ideologue, a huge dick. And they say everyone hates you because you're a dick. To what I'll call the internet left, however, she was broadly understood as an all-around decent critic, who was unfairly maligned, harassed, and abused because she was a woman who spoke about feminism and about her unfair treatment on the internet. Now, I feel like I'm coming off right now like I'm a weird, internet, reasonable man, and that's really not how I feel. That is, I side firmly with the internet left on this issue. I genuinely like Anita Sarkeesian. I agree with lots of her points and thought she was pretty cool before I knew she was somebody who everybody hated. Even if I didn't like her, though, I still wouldn't think she deserved the ire of the public. You know, threats and harassment from people who hated every fiber of her being. As an internet person myself, I've probably tasted less than 1% of the shit she has, and honestly, even that much is enough to send fear right through my whole bod. So, why am I bringing up all this stuff so early? It's because none of that stuff is really what I'm here to talk about. This video isn't about condemning the people who hated on or harassed Sarkeesian, nor is it a defense of her work. I mean, don't get me wrong, lots of the stuff I say here will be related to both of those things, but they're not really the point. No, this video is about one thing. It's about the way that art is interpreted and about how it's given meaning. I'm going to be looking closely at a few people, mostly Thunderfoot and Sargon of Akkad, people who strongly disagreed with Anita Sarkeesian and who made a series of arguments attempting to disprove her work. And my basic position here is that underpinning their work is an understanding of art that is both fundamentally misguided and ultimately pretty harmful. So if you're ready for some of that, I'm ready for some of this. Me talking to you for like 30 minutes about this stuff. Are you ready? Cool. Part one, what's at stake here? So over the course of her work, Anita Sarkeesian made her fair share of videos about games, and she covered a pretty wide variety of topics. But looking at her work altogether, we can see that it tends to revolve around two simple points that were both incredibly controversial on YouTube. And we're going to be spending, like, this entire video going through these points and seeing how people reacted to them. So here's the first big argument that Anita Sarkeesian wants to make. That looking at games, we can see a general tendency toward centralizing narratives of male and particularly straight male empowerment. And what's more, that this narrative tends to place the women of video games into some pretty weird positions. Women are less likely to be the protagonists of games. They're more likely to be presented as sexually appealing, to have their bodies put on display. They're more likely to take on passive or victimized positions, as damsels there to be rescued by predominantly male heroes. You know, things like that. The basic idea is that within many games, women are used as a prop, so that the mostly straight male audience can fantasize about attaining various forms of power. Now, the vast majority of Anita Sarkeesian's work is spent giving examples to support this position. And not being an expert in games myself, I can't really go through her work fact-checking each and every one of those examples. Besides, that's not really something that interests me anyway. So instead, let's just go through some videos made by Thunderfoot where he tries to argue that everything about Anita Sarkeesian's claim here is ridiculous. In the first moments of the first video Thunderfoot ever made about Anita Sarkeesian, he looks at what she says about the game Double Dragon, and tries to refute it with two pieces of evidence. First, Anita's idea that men are empowered and women disempowered by the story of this game is blatantly wrong, because at the end of the game, the damsel gets to punch the bad guy. The pattern of presenting women as fundamentally weak, 
ineffective, or ultimately incapable, has larger ramifications beyond the characters themselves. And yeah, that's right. The game that ends with Marion breaking a 20 foot tall super space lit man in half like a toothpick by punching him in the balls is apparently the pattern of presenting women as fundamentally weak, <laughs> ineffective, Second, that this story isn't about male power or female victimization at all. It's about love. I mean, let me just give you a couple of scenarios here, Anita. Billy's girlfriend gets punched in the stomach and abducted by a gang of thugs. Which of the following options defines the healthier relationship? That he immediately sets out risking his own safety to try and protect his loved ones? Or that he decides she's a grown adult and can look after herself? So, looking at both these bits of evidence, we can see a sort of interesting tendency in them. In a nutshell, it's the refusal to engage with art as something that is fundamentally different from the real world. Like, he approaches the events of Double Dragon as though they really happened, and given that approach, his arguments against Anita Sarkeesian kinda make sense. The woman who was kidnapped wasn't some passive object who needed saving. Actually, she acted like quite the badass, dealing the final blow against the bad guy. And our protagonist, Jimmy, he's not trying to gain power. His girlfriend was violently taken, and he acted nobly, risked everything to save her. If all these events really happened, they would tell the story of a hero, and of his capable GF who was put into a bad situation. And it would seem almost crude to use words like male power fantasy or female objectification to describe a story as beautiful as that. This argument from Thunderfoot is, of course, ridiculous. It goes without saying, but games aren't the same as real-life events. Because what happens in games is a choice made by people who wanted the experience of playing to be as fun or pleasurable or interesting as possible. Jimmy's girlfriend didn't need to get beaten up. We didn't need to see her panties as she was taken away. And while it may be somewhat empowering when she punches the bad guy, we can recognize that this action is not central to the game. Over the course of playing, you are always Jimmy, a bro who punches other bros. And your job is to rescue a woman who is entirely passive, and who has no control over what you do in the game. Double Dragon might be a story about heroism in some broad sense, but it's also a male power fantasy. It makes you feel good because you get to play as a badass. And part of that fantasy is obviously achieved through violence against and sexualization of a female character. And we can see a few more examples of this kind of argument popping up in Thunderfoot's videos. Like at one point, Anita wants to say that Mario games are generally male-centered narratives that are structured around women losing agency. But Thunderfoot has this to say. One problem with the Mario example. Mario, just so we are clear, is an Italian plumber. It really is hard to think of a more underrated, underprivileged, disposable, and instantly forgettable male. Peach, on the other hand, is a princess. Well, no privilege there then. Oh, I'm sorry, did your pop culture critic feminist and womanly skills miss that? And again, if Mario games happened in real life, he'd be correct. We would have to account for Peach's princess privilege and for Mario's blue-collar job. And it would be strange, looking at all that information, to say that Mario is the one with power here. But clearly, this doesn't really work. Looking at Mario games, it might be interesting to point out that Peach is of a higher social strata than Mario is. But as far as the game is concerned, this fact never means anything. For the entire game, Peach is a princess in name and dress alone. Her character exists only so that agency can be taken from her, so that the protagonist can save the day and win the lady back. So is this game a story about social structures? Well, 
Maybe. I mean, I kind of like that idea. But no matter what, it's also a story about dudes getting and exerting power, one that's facilitated through women losing power. One final example, and I'll try to keep this one short, because I know this is getting old. In a video called Women as Background Decoration, Anita Sarkeesian points to this scene as an example of the things we've been talking about. Sorry, all booked up. Too bad, too, because I would have given a stud like you a free sample. And Thunderfoot disagrees with her by saying this. Now, for Anita, that's just turning a woman into an object. However, I see a different image in this video game scene. This woman is not only in control, she's the one calling the shots. She's the one making her sexual intentions plain, which personally I think is entirely healthy. Now again, if this lady were a real human, Thunderfoot would be right that she was exerting agency here. Women wanting to have sex with hotties is not male-centric. It happens all the time. And for that reason, Thunderfoot can't see any male-centrism here. But no, this isn't the real world. It's a game. And while this character's actions can certainly be read as sexually liberating, and while I wouldn't blame anybody for reading it that way, we also have to acknowledge what this scene does and how it appeals to people. This woman probably doesn't have many other lines in this game. She doesn't seem like a person who has a number of character traits outside of her desire to have sex with the protagonist. She exists to say this line, to be sexual and to only be sexual, to make the player character feel powerful and cool. Too bad too, cause I would've given a stud like you a free sample. So why have I spent like five minutes now discussing one argument from a strange man on the internet? Are these points really deserving of all that attention? Have I said something that surprised you? Well, maybe not. But these positions are going to get interesting when we realize this refusal to engage with obvious and readily apparent interpretations of art, this failure to understand that we can interpret games differently from real life, this isn't some bad outlier in a sea of more coherent arguments. Rather, it's the main idea that these people rely on. It's what they're trying to sell us. Part 2 What's really at stake here? Okay, that's the first main position that Anita Sarkeesian wants to make. That games have a tendency toward centralizing male narratives, and toward using women as either props or afterthoughts in those narratives. So here's her second and much more important position. That games being like that? That's a problem. Anita isn't just here to make a bunch of neutral statements about what video games are like. She wants to say that video games have some relationship to things like sexism, misogyny, the patriarchy, negative and pervasive stuff she sees in our culture. And this second claim is really where the meat of Sarkeesian hate came from. See, people like Thunderfoot or Sargon like to make little arguments against Sarkeesian's descriptions of games, made the silly points we've talked about before, or nitpicked small errors in her analysis. See, she spoke too broadly about Hitman, her general observations about video games must be totally off base. But when we look at these people's videos, we can usually find a common gesture, one that's presented either explicitly or implicitly. Sure, they say, maybe games are often constructed around male ego fantasies, and maybe women are often subservient to those fantasies. But so what? Why is that bad or sexist or anything like that? What's wrong with the hot ladies in my video games? And, as we're gonna see, in order to sustain this attack on Anita Sarkeesian's work, in order to make her look as bad as humanly possible, these YouTubers are going to give us a very bent, unnatural vision of what media is and of how we can interact with it. So let's start with our main example, the thing we're going to talk about for the longest, the way these YouTubers discuss cultivation theory. 
Cultivation theory is an area of research in psychology that attempts to study and demonstrate the impact that media has on people, the sorts of behaviors and dispositions it cultivates. And when these YouTubers talk about this theory, it is always to point out that the research has proven it false. And apparently a fourfold rise in the number of people playing video games has not led to any kind of increase in violent crime whatsoever. It has in fact coincided with a decrease, a dramatic decrease in these crime rates, and this is despite the overall trend of increasing population. That games have no negative impacts. And after the game Burnout was released, you would have expected to have seen a dramatic increase in the number of people trying to cause as much damage as possible in a suicidal car wreck. And we didn't. That we have the science, and the science proves that Anita Sarkeesian is wrong. Because I am from Gamergate, and I care about facts and evidence and reason. Now, this argument is really fascinating to me, because it seems to rely on an understanding of art that is both totally wrong-headed and a bit gross. Like, okay, let's say, for the sake of argument, that these people are absolutely right about their science. Every study we've done shows that video games cause no shift in behavior or disposition. Our research into cultivation theory has given us nothing but a bunch of bummed-out psychologists. Now, assuming all this, let's ask a question. What exactly would these findings mean to Anita Sarkeesian's claim that video games can be harmful. Well, to these YouTubers, it seems like it would mean everything. Mean that her entire work was a sham. No matter how much Anita needs there to be a connection between playing video games and their behavior in reality, because let's be real, if there wasn't the entire premise of the series that she got feminists to give her $160,000 to explore, would be bullshit. But to me, it would mean absolutely nothing. And why is that? Well, here's one big reason. I don't think that science is actually capable of disproving obvious facts about the way people work. Media's ability to cultivate behaviors, emotions, and dispositions isn't some incidental point about it that requires further proof. Rather, it's the entire reason why media exists in the first place. People seek out art to be affected by it, to learn things or feel things. People make art to give others those experiences, to connect with their audience or persuade them or whatever. Media is cultivation. It is the process through which the ideas and imaginations of others can be made somewhat available to us so that we can understand and be affected by them. And science might be able to describe and quantify the impact that art has, but it can't be used to deny the fact that art exists, or that what it says matters to us. But okay, as much as I like this sort of utopian talk about how art is inherently meaningful, and as much as I think that's true, it doesn't really resolve Thunderfoot or Sargon's challenge here. Sure, they might say, art is by its nature an act of cultivation, but how are we supposed to know what it's cultivating? And more than that, how can we possibly tell when that cultivation is bad? Well, to these tubers, to make the claim that any work of art is cultivating bad stuff, we'd have to look at the way that work of art is received by the surrounding culture. Study the impact that it's had, and find out if it's causing real people to do terrible things to each other. So, I guess we're back to using science and cultivation theory to prove our points about media. And, since the murder rate isn't up, and since sex crimes aren't on the rise, I guess that the pattern Sarkeesian is pointing out in video games can't really be a bad thing. Now, I can honestly see why this argument was compelling to people. It seems to make a lot of sense, right? If you want to say that art is bad, you gotta make sure that it causes bad stuff to happen. But even though I'm sympathetic to the people who bought into this logic, it is still, as far as I'm concerned, terrible logic. And that's for one reason. When people say that art has destructive or toxic messages, 
they are almost never referring to the literal destructive impact that the art had on the real world. Instead, they're making a claim about the work itself, about what it says to us. So, to show you what I mean by that, Let's do a little thought experiment. Say a film is made that is unabashedly Nazi propaganda. Let's call it Lubin Schlubin. Every moment in this film conveys an unironic love for Nazis and an explicit hatred of Jews. Let's say that this film is so horrendously racist that nobody in society can possibly be influenced by it to become Nazis. The vast majority of people watch it critically, tear it apart, maybe even reflect on how silly and gross Nazism is. The remaining minority might enjoy and agree with the film, but those people are incapable of becoming more Nazi than they already are. They are peak Nazi, already agreeing with all of the film's messages before they ever saw it. Now, if what Sargon and Thunderfoot says is true, if the only way to say a work of art is toxic is to look at its literal impact on society, then we would be unable to condemn Lubinschlubin, since the film has no tangible effect on anyone's behavior. But, see, that position makes no sense at all. Everybody with a brain knows that this movie is bad politically, not in a way that means we should ban it, but in a way that is worthy of our scorn and disgust. And it's not bad because somebody might become a Nazi when they see it. No, it's bad because it advocates bad things. Nazis are evil. Lubinschlubin likes Nazis, so Lubinschlubin is evil. That's it. Our burden of proof has been met. Now, watching Anita Sarkeesian's videos, she does cite cultivation theory a few times. Says there's a causal relationship between video games being the way they are and people being sexist. And to be honest, I kinda wish she hadn't said those things. Like, I think they're probably valid to some extent, but I do genuinely believe that cultivation theory is a huge, confusing red herring and a waste of a media critic's time nine times out of ten. But that said, when you look at the trajectory of Sarkeesian's work, you can see that she means something very similar to what we described in our thought experiment. We can see this whenever she talks about games. It's pretty obvious, but let's just look at one example. In her discussion of Double Dragon, she calls the game's treatment of violence against women regressive crap. Most recently, Double Dragon Neon in 2012 reintroduced new gamers to this regressive crap yet again. And it's not like she had some data to back that up, right? She didn't wait for the Double Dragon studies to come in and prove that the game causes regressive behaviors. And of course she didn't do that, because she doesn't have to. She is a person who experienced this work of art, and she's claiming here that what she saw in it was bad. That it normalizes the idea that women should be used as passive props in the narratives of men. That it stipulates that violence against women can be understood as erotic. When Anita Sarkeesian sees these things in society, she thinks they're awful problems. And for that reason, and that reason alone, she also thinks they're awful when advocated for in media. Okay, I can already feel some comments coming in objecting to the things I've said here, and that's fair enough, so let's move on to some other anti-Anita Sarkeesian arguments. Like, here's a thing that these YouTubers might say. Sure, it's maybe the case that certain Nazi propaganda films can be condemned on their own merits, because they explicitly call for harmful acts to be done. But that same logic cannot be applied so easily to the games that Anita says are problematic, because those games don't all call for harmful acts. Like, Sarkeesian criticizes the use of prostitution in games. But, as Thunderfoot points out, prostitution is not inherently any more immoral than is any other labor exchange. We're all selling our bodies in one way or another, so why are we gunning after sex work here? You see, the core here is Anita wants women to be ashamed of selling sex or sexual imagery. And I think that if they want to make an informed decision to sell sex or sexual imagery, then that's fine. 
or Sarkeesian criticizes the use of damsels in video games. But as the Amazing Atheist points out in his cameo in this video, when women are damseled in these games, it's usually posed as a negative thing, something that the protagonist must put an end to. I could perhaps understand that attitude if the games Anita was attacking were advocating such a thing, but these acts are almost universally committed by the bad guys, who the hero must then defeat. Now, honestly, I think this is a really lackluster argument. It just doesn't make sense to reserve our judgments of media to only those things that the work is actively calling for. We also have to look at subtext and coding, and the way that the work creates meaning in the wider worlds of art and culture. And keeping with our Nazi propaganda theme, which I guess we have here, uh, let's use, let's use this boy as an example. Now, if we were all living in some kind of post-bigotry utopia that never had any concept of anti-Semitism, it's hard to see why this image would be a problem. There's nothing wrong with having a greedy character in your media, so why would it be wrong here? And yes, this guy is recognizably a grotesque rendering of various Jewish characteristics, but why is that a problem? Isn't it okay to draw people, Jewish people included, in a grotesque manner? And besides, what harm is this image advocating? He's just a boy, an innocent boy minding his own business, hunting for turnips. But no, this image obviously sucks, because in the society it was used in, it conveyed terrible ideas. It served to implicitly justify racial hierarchy and to normalize the idea that Jewish people were subhuman. It is because we recognize that this piece of art is a reflection of the culture that made it, and because the opinions expressed by it are still present in modern society, that we say this art is harmful. It's not all about what happens on the surface level. And because of this, when we're presented with these games, we'll sometimes have to answer complicated questions. For instance, what perspective does this game have on prostitution? Oh, hello, honey. Looking for a good time? I can give you a good deal. <laughs> Too bad you have friends along. I'm not into group thing. Come around next time. I might even give you a freebie to make up for it. Does it make us reconsider our puritanical sex-negative biases? Give us empathy for the people who work these jobs? Or does it sort of thoughtlessly glorify a series of bad things? Portray sex trafficking and tourism as fun and goofy and alluring? Play into a historical tendency to treat Asian people as exotic and subservient? I haven't played whatever game I'm pulling a clip from here. I can't answer this question, and the answer might be very complex. But when Anita Sarkeesian says that the second answer is more true, and gives evidence for the idea that that's a common theme in video games, responding with the statement, but in a vacuum, prostitution is perfectly fine, is not a real argument. It doesn't actually deal with the work at hand or the society that made it. All it's really saying is, I don't see anything wrong with this drawing. I can't see what you're finding a problem with here. And it's like, cool, you know? Got him, dude. Alright, uh, one last super quick argument. Thunderfoot sometimes says that games can't be sexist or harmful because they're sold under capitalism and people buy them. Notice how the camera moves, how it focuses on and zooms in on specific body parts to highlight the aspects of women meant to be the most important. My god, this pop critic has sharp skills. Yeah, that's quite right, Anita. The camera focuses on the sexual nature of the women because in reality, the audience is mostly men. He says that, like, a fair amount, and I think these other guys do too. It's almost as if these games are designed primarily for men and boys, isn't it? Yeah, it's almost as if they had a particular demographic in mind, and they catered to that demographic. Claim 3. The video game industry is dominated by male perspectives. Surprise, fucking surprise. But what he seems to have forgotten is that you can buy cigarettes under capitalism, and you can buy an apple 
under capitalism. Cigarettes kill 400,000 people every year, but apples, they don't do nearly that much damage. It's actually said that they keep the doctors away. You might think that cigarettes should remain legal, and I'm sympathetic to that idea, but you'd have a hard time convincing me that they're not harmful to the people who use them. Thus, I have proven that not everything sold under capitalism is equally good for us. Okay, so looking at all these arguments that these guys made to try to show that Anita Sarkeesian's points were bad, we've been trying to figure out if what they were saying in these videos was true. But now that we've shown that they're not true, at least to my satisfaction, it only makes sense to ask a different kind of question. What are these arguments here to do? What do they want from us? And the answer is simple. These arguments whittle away at our ability to interact with media as media, to prevent us from making any kind of claim about the impact or importance of art. Whether it's because the science hasn't come in yet, or because we can only talk about the explicit message of a work, or because capitalism functions as some kind of safety blanket against criticism, the point is always the same. You may think that you can talk about the worth of art from a political or moral perspective, but in fact, that's just a mirage. Anything you say about media is just an unverified and likely unsupportable position, and you should probably forget about it. But where does that leave us? Part 3. So what's at stake here? Do these people, Thunderfoot and Sargon, do they really believe any of the stuff they've been saying? Well, no, of course not. These guys like to pretend like they hate Anita Sarkeesian not because of what she says, but because of who she is and the damage she causes. They talk about how she sucks because she released her videos slowly and didn't like being harassed on the internet. Talk about how she's a fraudulent grifter who gets her lackeys to phone in bomb threats so she can make more money. She's actually a con artist who fakes and orchestrates her own harassment in order to gain sympathy, which she uses to scam people into giving her money. It, it's, it is kind of funny because it's so ridiculous. Is that ridiculous though? Because, I mean, you have benefited from threats made at you. About how she's a fake gamer and so she shouldn't be talking about games. About how she's a hypocrite because she's pretty and uses her clothes and makeup to look even prettier. You know, because it's not like you in real life would ever use appearance-enhancing cosmetics, you know, like, to, like bright red lipstick to imply arousal or eye makeup to draw people's attention to your eyes. Do you think that if I had sex with her, she'd cuck me? <laughs> And while I'm sure that these guys really believe all of those things, we can still read between the lines here a little bit. These guys are unapologetically anti-feminist, and because of that, they see no reason to change media to make it more feminist. And they don't criticize Anita Sarkeesian's work because of cultivation theory. I mean, where are the studies that show that these videos are causing murder rates to increase? And they don't criticize Anita Sarkeesian's work because she explicitly calls for immoral actions. All she does is give her opinions about media, right? And they don't criticize Anita Sarkeesian's videos because they exist outside some benevolent capitalist structure. I've got some hot news for you. Anita Sarkeesian's work is actually facilitated by capitalism. No, they hate Anita Sarkeesian's work mostly because she says stuff they think is bad. She's a feminist who wants various things about games to change, and they disagree with her vehemently about it. It's the same basic reason why she criticizes games. They just hold the opposite position. And saying all this, it kind of makes you wonder why I'm even making this video. I mean, I've spent god knows how long now giving my case against these arguments that were said like five years ago. They center on a feminist critic who's a lot less relevant than she used to be. And meanwhile, the people making these points don't even seem to believe them. How is this not just me wasting my time? Well, here's why I'm making this video. Because people like these use arguments like the ones we've talked about to try to control your mind, intentionally or unintentionally. 
They are alienating you from one of the most fundamental things about being a human. Your ability to understand and interpret art as a person who lives in our culture. Your capacity to recognize messages and to treat the minds and ideas of other people as important. You give all that up, and what do you even get in return? A big slab of dirt that says fuck feminism on it? A meaningless token that reminds you that your games are fine and that nothing should ever change about them and that anybody who says different is just an unenlightened snowflake? Sargon and Thunderfoot and whoever else, these people want to convince you that they're offering a good deal here. That they are giving you more than they are taking away. But they're wrong, and it matters that they're wrong. So, uh, that's the end of that incredibly long video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you did, go ahead and like, comment, and subscribe, and give me money on Patreon if you want to, or whatever. Uh, now it's time, speaking of patrons, for my Patreon question of the video. Miles Tufts asks, Hey Mr. Joel, how much thought do you put into your costuming slash set design for the camera plus narration segments in your videos? Uh, hours and hours to choose that blank red background and put on that sweater. But I did get a haircut for this video uh, to look better for it, so maybe that counts for something. So all of the time it took to get that haircut, uh, that's it. Alright, uh, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!